no guns shoot, no bombs drop. But upon what these manned and unmanned vehicles see and photograph depends the survival of all mankind. The desperate need of one superpower to know immediately what the other is about to do has made aerial surveillance the most powerful deterrent to actual warfare the world yet knows. The function of air reconnaissance is primarily to provide information and intelligence of what your enemy is doing. I conceive of reconnaissance probably as being the single most essential asset to national survival and international security today. The sneaky game of spying on other people began in the Napoleonic Wars, when balloonists joined the birds to share their visions of happenings below. Although there were grumblings about such ungentlemanly behavior, the Americans during their civil war did the same thing, and learned more about the enemy, his movements and his guns than telescopes from the highest hills. When the Great War began, spying from the air had changed little. Balloons still reported, now by phone, what the other side was doing. Updated to powered airships, they became mobile and flew around Britain's coastline to sound the alarm when U-boats surfaced. Those which remained tethered were spectacular targets for pilots out for a bit of sport and ground gunners. One shot and they exploded in a ball of fire, their occupants incinerated. air reconnaissance was born when cameras began to fly with observation planes. The cameras were heavy and inefficient. The aircraft so slow that they were almost as vulnerable as the captive balloons. No one was trained to interpret the photographs they brought back and valuable information was often overlooked. But Allied and German commanders were reluctantly forced to accept this newfangled approach to warfare as something of value. The camera carrying planes soon changed the attitude of fledgling airmen towards each other. Aerial dogfights, once gentlemanly contests between respected equals, became desperate battles. But between the wars, the lessons learned about air spying were filed away and forgotten. I think one can say that World War II was sprung upon us. We didn't really uh, expect it. We weren't prepared for it. So that photographic reconnaissance as such, PR, uh, wasn't very much thought about in the 1930s. We were, we were actively engaged in producing the newest and the best types of fighters, like the Hurricane and the Spitfire. But we didn't really pay a great deal of attention to photo reconnaissance. What we did do was to put cameras in some of those aircraft and say, well, you can do that at the same time. It was left to a civilian to prove the vital need for aerial reconnaissance. Sidney Cotton, an Australian businessman and pilot, 
proved his point by stripping Spitfires of heavy armament and replacing it with cameras and long-range fuel tanks so that they could then outrun and outfly the enemy. soon realized that accurate photo reconnaissance could mean the difference between victory or defeat. The Germans kept pace with spy planes and cameras, but never managed to match the British expertise to interpret the photographs they took. High-definition photographs of German war plants, such as the V-2 site at Finamunda, enabled masses of night-flying RAF bombers to pinpoint their targets. And after every raid, aircraft such as Britain's Wooden Wonder, the near-invulnerable Mosquito, flew low and fast to the target to obtain photographic evidence of the effect of the raid. This enabled the Allies to assess the hits and misses within hours of the bombings. At the end of World War II, when it became evident, particularly to our military leaders, that we were facing a whole new ball game, nuclear weapons had been developed, there was some growing understanding that the Soviet Union was the greatest threat to our survival and security. I think in the late 40s, the United States began to think through and began to invest large sums of money on building a, uh, a sharply increased reconnaissance capability to surveil the Soviet Union, to surveil the world's oceans, and to surveil the world's trouble spots. In 1960, an American super spy plane, which should not have been where it was, brought the world to Flashpoint. Financed by the Central Intelligence Agency, whose secret activities would soon end, U-2s had been photographing Russian missile sites from a height of 10 miles. Everything about the U-2 was top secret until a Russian guided missile brought one and its pilot Gary Powers to Earth. Nikita Khrushchev, Russia's leader, gloated about communist supremacy. He showed the Supreme Soviet photographs of Russian airfields and industrial works. These, he said, were taken by Powers. At Moscow's Gorky Park, the wreckage of the American U-2 went on display. The remains of the engine, the ejector seat, the tail part of the fuselage and the oxygen containers. Also on show was a silent pistol, dagger, suicide capsule, Russian money and other currency. The Russians had a field day. At his trial in Moscow, Powers pleaded guilty to espionage and was sentenced to 10 years in prison. In 1962, he was exchanged for a Russian prisoner and the world breathed easier. But the U-2s kept flying. The same year, 
Another U-2 set the scene for a far more serious American-Russian confrontation. Fidel Castro's Cuba, American intelligence reported, was being turned into a missile site. The United States provided photographic evidence of missile installations and Russian ships with weapons aboard. Cuban mobs hailed their leader. In Washington, America's decision makers, including Vice President Johnson, raced to the White House to endorse President Kennedy's virtual declaration of war. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Let no one doubt that this is a difficult and dangerous effort on which we have set out. Many months of sacrifice and self-discipline lie ahead, months in which both our patience and our will will be tested months in which many threats and denunciations will keep us aware of our dangers. But the greatest danger of all would be to do nothing. America's Air Force and Navy were ordered to blockade Cuba and turn back the Russian ships. U-2s brought back hour-to-hour -hour reports of what was going on. Then the Russians added to the tension, shooting down their second U-2 and killing its pilot, Major Anderson. America mobilized and prepared for war. Then to the world's surprised relief, Khrushchev produced another anticlimax. He called the whole thing off. But how close had the world come to an atomic war? I think the events of Cuba and the missile crisis constitute one of the greatest public relations hoaxes ever perpetrated by an American president and his administration. We were never close to war. There was never the slightest danger of war. And this was highly exaggerated by the White House in order to achieve one of the, as I say, one of the great public relations hoaxes of history in which all kinds of heroics were added to this. The crisis has been played up as one of the greatest ever faced by Western civilization. Nothing of the kind ever happened. From the day that we discovered the first Soviet missile aboard a, a Soviet steamer, the United States was mobilized for war, and we were so vastly superior from that day on to the Soviet Union, it is not conceivable that in their wildest imagination, the Soviets would have entertained a nuclear initiative against the United States. Cuba, while initially potentially dangerous, was in fact one of the greatest pieces of Hollywood hucksterism in the history of this country or any other free country. Apart from the nightly televised war reports, Vietnam was neither a bluff nor Hollywood hucksterism. It was just the wrong place for modern warfare. The Viet Cong hid in the jungle by day and came out by night. And a force pinpointed by the most sophisticated spy plane wasn't there when the shells or bombs fell. The Viet Cong was weak in the air but strong on the ground, repairing damage as quickly as it was caused. As in past conflicts, photo reconnaissance played an important role in Vietnam. But Soviet-supplied missiles began to bring down too many spy planes and too many pilots.
This graphic series of stills shows the effect of a ground-to-air missile on an American Phantom jet. Faced with these losses, the Americans began to develop pilotless alternatives and brought in their most sophisticated eye in the sky, the newly developed SR-71. The SR-71 Blackbird is the fastest and highest flying spy plane in the world, ahead of anything the Russians have. Flying at three times the speed of sound, its super secret cameras can, within an hour, photograph a hundred square miles of the Earth's surface. A titanium shell protects the two-man crew, clad like astronauts, against the tremendous heat generated by supersonic speeds in the upper atmosphere. As the aircraft can be refueled by a flying mother, its time aloft is limited only by the physical endurance of the pilot and the electronic systems operator. Long before this most sophisticated of all spy planes was on the drawing boards, space scientists had spent billions of dollars preparing for this. Missing submarine to lock condition. Status check. Command on internal. Affirmative. Telemetry in launch condition. Affirmative. Missile in internal DC. Affirmative. Pressurization complete. Affirmative. Two. One. Launching on April Fool's Day, 1960, of the forerunner of the Russian and American satellites which now dot the stratosphere. Just how many eyes in the sky are spinning around is not public knowledge, but it is known that in 1981, Russia launched 110 spacecraft and the United States 13. The Russians have so many that they can photograph any target in the West twice in the same day. With cameras so advanced, they can even count the number of plates laid out for a Saturday afternoon's barbecue, and from 90 miles up. Above the Earth, military communications satellites are used by ships at sea, planes, soldiers on patrol, and search and rescue teams. It was hard realism, not romantic fancies, that led man to the moon. In world wars, hundreds of thousands of lives were sacrificed to take a high hill for observation. The moon was that ultimate hill, and for looking down on all mankind. And it brought technology that might otherwise have been ignored. Heat-resistant ceramics, solar-powered batteries, specialized metals, high-definition cameras, microcircuitry, ultra-long-range television and radio. A magician's box of inventions. The Apollo moon landings confirmed to a worldwide television audience the scope of man's ingenuity, and heralded a new era of technological discovery. 
there is no doubt that they can get an enormous amount of, inf of information from satellite photography. Uh, resolution now is extremely good. It's almost as good as probably it ever will be. But there are certain difficulties. Uh, for example, you can camouflage uh, certain uh, targets on the ground so that however often the satellite passes over them, it won't really tell us what's underneath. That happened on the development of Russia's massive uh, new attack submarine called the Oscar, which was being built under camouflage netting of various kinds. And originally, it was suggested that it was a cruiser. When the netting was taken away, of course, it turned out to be a very large submarine indeed. <laughs> The third arm of reconnaissance is the need to know what is going on at ground level. And the Jaguars and men of 41 Squadron RAF are in a continual state of readiness. The Anglo-French Jaguar can be either a bomber or a low-level spy plane, which can get in and out quickly and avoid radar detection. The reconnaissance version carries automated navigation systems, a computer and a moving map and head-up display, which project flight and target location directly into the pilot's line of vision. In its chisel nose are laser ranging and target seeking equipment. mission behind the Iron Curtain, the Jaguar could fly at supersonic speeds at hedge top level, photograph everything within sight, and get out before humans on the ground could react to its presence. Base, the exposed magazines are quickly removed and new ones inserted, instantly ready for the next mission. The Jaguar has five cameras, four for visible light, one for infrared. Even in peace, air crews and ground staff follow exactly the same procedure they would in war.
No time is lost. The film magazines are rushed to a war-ready laboratory for immediate processing. A spectroscope shows images in three dimensions. The reconnaissance pilot joins the photo interpreter as they view and select the negatives for printing. Yes. What about control buildings? See any? Just a small one, I think, just for uh, standby power. Power into the site? The line's coming in here from the uh, southeast. See anything on your starboard side? Yeah, I should see the uh, broadcasting buildings down here on this film coming in. There they are. Just at the bottom. Yeah. Select this one for the target library. Okay. The shots are then sent for detailed analysis. Make a print of that one. Should show the target quite nicely. This time, there are photographs of a power station, radar installations, and an armored column on the move. But aerial reconnaissance is not only restricted to targets on land. Hey, good morning, gentlemen. Today's sortie is a five-hour surveillance mission in the southwestern approaches to the English Channel outlined in Area A. We'll start our surveillance the reconnaissance crews of Britain's RAF Strike Command keep daily surveillance over coastal waters. Back down to the southwest before turning back up to the northeast to finish our surveillance to the south of Land's End. They fly the Nimrod, considered to be the most advanced maritime aircraft in the world. extended fishery limits out to 200 miles from the British coastline. In wartime, the Nimrods would be submarine hunters and killers. The Nimrods are virtually flying laboratories equipped with the latest computers, surveillance, communication, navigation, radar, sonar and radio, plus a top secret device to avoid detection. The movement of all shipping, legal or illegal, is monitored. In a typical patrol, the Nimrods report, observe and photograph between 50 and 150 foreign and British vessels. the sorties are routine. But sometimes something special is sighted, like a Russian warship.
distant and close-up photographs are taken for the experts in the back room to study and analyze. An opportunity to check on Russian design, their weaponry, and on-deck surveillance equipment. But for that big, all-embracing look at what's happening in every quarter of the globe, high up there are the orbiting satellites. America's Landsat is not a spy satellite, at least not officially. Its main job is to look at world resources for the benefit of friendly nations. Circling the Earth 250 times every 18 days, its sensors measure light reflected from the Earth's surface in a mosaic of squares, seven and a half million of which cover 115 square miles. Mountain ranges, rivers, lakes, forests, coastlines and cities are revealed for taping and analysis. The electronic signals are converted by ground stations, such as this one, into visual images and store them on a high-density magnetic tape. Two sensors on the satellites measure visible light and two others work with infrared rays. The information is then fed into a computer and made available in various ways. They include the production of color pictures, film transparencies and computer-compatible tapes. Hey, drop out to you. Any other problems? No, not on the stage. That's good so far. Man's definitely coming out all right? Yes. Good. By combining any three images, technicians of the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization in Canberra introduce and then intensify color so that particular features, such as forests, deserts, coral reef or growing crops, all of which give different light readings, stand out. These can be enlarged for intensive study. Canberra has isolated Landsat's images of Australia's Great Barrier Reef. By introducing colour, the reef appears in light blue. Heron Island, off Australia's east coast, is an example of how the colour coding works on its landmass, beaches and reef. Once the colour of each feature is coded, it can be extended to build up a complete and accurate representation of the entire Barrier Reef its islands, beaches, open spaces and coral formations. No longer is the professional spy needed to ferret out a country's secrets. The satellites have taken over. Power and wealth to the multinational speculator could come from immediate knowledge that famine was in one country and plenty in another, and unsuspected geological features which could lead to major oil and mineral exploitation. Rivers, lakes, dams and rainfall 
could be analyzed to assess whether there was enough water to maintain agricultural industries such as rice and sugar. And all the time, rockets are launching satellites into space, each one to perform better than the one it replaced. Some, like the American Vela satellites, were put up for a special purpose, to detect nuclear detonations, not only in the atmosphere, but more than a million miles into outer space. The Vela came close to Earth, then orbited far into the emptiness of space. Time, satellites designed to aid the navigation of ships at sea, and presumably also aircraft, serve an important need. But these are also a danger to countries hosting their ground stations, for in the event of an atomic war, they could become top priority targets. Apart from communication satellites linking the world, those sending back photographs upon which weather forecasts are based are the only ones the true purpose of which the average man understands. Former President Lyndon Johnson, however, said that one spy satellite was worth ten times the billions of dollars spent on putting man into space. But just how effective is the entire American reconnaissance program? I view our achievements in reconnaissance as having contributed to one succession of failures after another. To begin with, the availability of this new reconnaissance technology has resulted in a number of giant bureaucratic struggles between the military bureaucracy and the civilian bureaucracy. In this case, in this country, particularly with the CIA, who learned very early that the control of reconnaissance and its products is political power. And it is the ability, it gives you the ability to control what is told to the Congress and what is told or not told to the people and what is told or not told to the presidents. Success or not, the race for superiority goes on. And this is the still secret TR-1. The U-2, which it replaces, did its job. But at least two were shot down by ground-to-air missiles. The TR-1 will fly faster and higher than the U-2 to spy on Russian military sites. And there are rumors it may also have protection against radar. The development of remote pilotless spy vehicles has not yet been fully accepted by defense departments. This is the Compass Cope, designed by Teledyne Ryan in California. This remote pilotless vehicle is capable of flying more than 8,000 miles at an altitude of 55,000 feet. With a full load of reconnaissance equipment, it could be pre-programmed to fly any route and take photographs of specified targets on the way. And there is America's latest achievement, the Space Shuttle. This stub-winged space airliner has been designed to carry spy satellites to low Earth orbits, where they will be deployed for use or transferred to higher orbits. It means that the Space Shuttle can also retrieve satellites, and maybe Russian ones the Americans would like to examine. It is the only satellite launcher which, unlike rockets, can be used again and again.
but is it vital so much be spent on aerial surveillance? I don't see how the free nations can emerge successfully from this decade. I don't see how they can survive without a massive surveillance and reconnaissance of the entire globe. I think reconnaissance, therefore, both manned, unmanned, and from space, is probably the single most essential ingredient to mankind's survival. The West must have the capability of knowing what the Russians are doing every hour of the day and night, every day of the year. has the Western world been so ultra-sensitive during peace. Radar picks up an unidentified aircraft over the North Sea, and an Aria Phantom Squadron at full alert reacts to the potential threat. Guided from land and by their own electronic systems, the Phantoms zero in. And this is what they see. A lone Russian spy plane to be photographed close up and then shadowed against invading British airspace. And so the never-ending game of you spy and I spy goes on. From far out in space, from border hopping supersonic spies too high in the air to be seen, and from those flying too low to be detected. And all with one aim, to be the first to know what the others are doing at all times. <laughs> 